Okay, let's go to Acts, uh, the book of Acts again. We're going to be in chapter 5 today. I do appreciate everyone being here, and everybody's in their place. And believe it or not, I do look for that. It's like Mark, I was looking for him, so going, where are you this morning? Oh, here, there he is. So you're in your place. And, and believe it or not, uh, in a prophetic room, uh, I do look that we're in our places, and that we're here now, believe it or not, you play a part in this room, and uh, the the uh, in uh, jazz music you use the terminology you play to the room, and you 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 sense the room and what's going on. It's a spiritual terminology, but in this class and those who are watching online, uh, I believe people have their place. You bring something to the room. And uh, it helps us in trying to discover what the Lord would have for us today. And I believe that the Word of God is that live and that real. Amen. All right, we're going to be looking at that same understanding and concepts in the Scriptures this morning uh, in the book book of Acts. And I want to, this is uh, Lesson 28, and we're in Chapter uh, 5. This is a teaching, I call it uh, the study in the book of Acts with Paul's writings. I haven't mentioned this in the last few weeks, but uh, I say that a study in the book of Acts with Paul's writings, and the reason is uh, most of Paul's writings you can insert into the Acts period. As you, the book of Acts covers about 32 years, plus or minus a year or two, and so since it's covering a 32-year period, and since we understand the Apostle Paul got caught up into the third heaven, and he got different revelations at different times, and then he would write it in letters and send it out to the churches. And most of them were during this Acts period. So as Paul went to the third heaven, as he was giving these different revelations to give to the church, every time he went to the third heaven, he didn't get the same information. He got further information to add to the church. And so progressively, in, in the kind of a chronological order, we understand that these divine revelations over a 32-year period, it's a long time, that we know that the Holy Spirit shows the church. You have the church at the beginning of the book of Acts, outpouring of the Spirit, tremendous power. The end of the book of Acts, Paul was saying, you need, we got to take up a little money to send to those poor saints in Jerusalem. Something shifted from the beginning of Acts to the end of Acts. And everybody says, well, I want to go to Acts uh, for our um, church doctrine and how we carry on church. And I always say, well, the, you want the front part of Acts or the back? Which, which part of Acts are you going to go to? And so we need to understand what's going on in uh, the book of Acts. And then we find ourselves here today. Now, in understanding Scripture, I personally believe that once God gives a truth to the earth, it's just a truth to the earth. And He doesn't, God gives truth to the earth in such a way, He never has to withdraw that truth. So, therefore, if God did healing in Acts 2, 3, 4, whatever, God still does healing today. It's just because once God gives a truth, it wouldn't have been a truth if He had to take it back. Truth is eternal. Truth's the Holy Spirit. It's eternal. So when you're working out your theology, you have to work it out in a way that none of the truth of God's Word is extracted from God's Word. Are, are you with me? Now that's very, it's, it'll put you in a bind sometime. Because you don't know what to do with it. But it's okay to say you don't know what to do with it. And say, I'm working on it to see what I'm going to do with this, with this truth. <clears throat> so that's the way the Scriptures are unfolded. God gives the truth. He never takes back. Now, He might progress, give more revelation on a single truth. Just like animal sacrifice, take the obvious, animal sacrifice is a truth. And then progressively, God gave more information on what was going on with that truth. Then we start learning with that truth that that was symbolic 
right? Giving animal sacrifice was actually symbolic. It in itself didn't do anything. But the obedience to it did. The animal sacrifice didn't really do it, but the obedience to it did. Uh, uh, in the book, I'll say this, I'll use this for reference, but I'll use it again. In the book of Genesis, God uh, told Noah to build a boat, and if he did that, it would save him and his house. You remember that? And that's what we call the gospel according to Noah. It was good news to Noah from God. God gave the truth to Noah, build a boat, save you and your house. That was the gospel to Noah. Guess what? He was obedient and it saved him and his house. But when I'm given the gospel today, I don't tell somebody to go build a boat and it'll save him and his house. Right? Because progressively I've gotten more revelation of the symbolic. See, see God deals in symbols. Now it's, it's obedience to the symbol. We take communion. Well, the, 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 the elements don't do anything, but the obedience to it does cause the elements to do something. In other words, you can't be obedient to communion without taking the elements. And so when we're obedient to it, it lines us up in a situation that God will use that symbol to become alive and do something in our life. So it's really, so you got to understand the language of God as we go through the book of Acts, the language of God through the scriptures. And just remember this, the key is not what you're to do, it's the obedience, it's the obedient heart unto what we should do. As we can tell somebody, well you didn't do that right, now the Bible says you need to do this. Well, you can go do it, but if, if you're not doing it out of obedience of your heart, it's just not worth anything. Can, can you hear what I'm saying? That for us to do what God's Word says, and we're doing it out of legalism, doesn't do anything. But when it comes out of our heart, because we want to be obedient to what God says, it performs miracles. So that's what we want to see as we continue through the book of Acts here. It's obe and that's reason to God's Word. It's the obedience to God's Word that's the issue. You say, well, God doesn't heal every time we pray. That's not the issue. Sorry. Are you obedient unto that is the issue. The healing's left up to God, just as everything else is on planet Earth. So it's not that God doesn't heal. That's not the issue. Did you know everybody that Jesus healed died? So it's obvious that healing wasn't the issue. But, the, but obedience has eternal value. Are you with me? See, obedience here has everything to do with eternal value there. Are you with me? I can feel the Holy Ghost. I don't know if y'all can. The Holy Ghost is saying, yeah, Alan, keep preaching. That's true. That's what he's saying. So, obedience has to do with eternal value. There's times he'll give us a token symbol to that obedience here. But it doesn't change the point of obedience. We will pray for the sick until we leave and go to glory. Why? That is what we're to do to be obedient to the Scripture. We're also to care for the dying. That's being obedient to the Scripture. But I'll give you a harder one than that. We're to care for the living. That's the tough one. It's to care for the living. So, as you look at these symbols as we move forward, I want you to catch something and take note to something here. They should just slap a slobber out of your mouth. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> it should just shake you real good. Now watch this. And that, that's a redneck term. That's all. Some of y'all, some perhaps won't quite get that. Now, now look at this. All here, and I did this one last week. 
<clears throat> in hopes of I was going to get into why I put it up there. And I didn't get into why I put it up there. So therefore, I will repeat myself this morning. All heroes are shadows of Christ. I like that one, John Piper. Uh, I don't agree with him all the way through theologically, but I found out something. He doesn't agree with me all the way theologically either. And so I'll probably come around to more his thinking before it's over with. But, but John Piper said, now, now watch this, and all heroes are shadows of Christ. I just, for some reason, that one grabbed me back when I first read it, and it just captured me because I knew that was a, he was saying more than just what you were reading. And so then I, 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 it was proper then for me to tie that into today's teaching. Now, it, we're going to move on into Acts 5 here, and this is the power of the church. And I got verses, if you'll see, <clears throat> for those of you that take notes, I'll put uh, Acts 5, verses 12 through 16. And what, what's the content, what's going on in 12 through 16? It's the power of the, of the Holy Church. That's the context of those verses. So that's what we're... And so at each group of verses... And when you do like, <clears throat> when you do a, a, this type of teaching, you've got two, three, four, five, six verses usually that's pertaining to a particular issue, and, you, and this is what we call we want to keep it in context. And so what I'm doing is I'm breaking it up into the contextual sets of Scripture. I'll always have this at the top of my slides. So this is Acts 5, 12 through 16. What is the context of this group of scriptures? It is the power of a holy church. So now let's look at the scripture in 513. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. It's talking about uh, the disciples and what was going on. Peter was preaching, and it was saying that uh, nobody was joined unto them, but people magnified them, and believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. So here we see that the believers were added unto the Lord, not unto the disciples. Now this is important to somebody like me, and the reason is you can have a church built around a personality, around a big preacher we call it, around a, a super preacher. Now there's some there's some men out there that you could, just can flat preach. They just can. And, and I, it seems to me that we don't have preachers like we used to have, but we probably do. I just hadn't met them. But there's something about we here at this church, we don't want to build around a, a, a particular personalities. We've got great worship, and we've got great... That's not the idea. The idea here is who's in charge here, and we work hard to say that Jesus Christ is the one. Now, listen, no doubt we fail miserably, okay? It's not, a, it's not about that we're pulling it off. But it is about us being uh, uh, obedient unto that scriptural idea of a church. The scriptural idea of this church is we want Jesus to be in charge here. Now, that's a wide open statement. It'll get you in a lot of trouble because there's, it just so happens last time I counted 150,434 different interpretations of what I just said. That's just showing an exaggeration, but you get what I'm saying. There's a lot of different interpretations to what does it look like uh, when Jesus is in charge here. And I'll clue you in on this. Jesus is in charge here as God's people allow Jesus to be in charge of their lives as they walk in those doors here. Okay? Now, keep that in mind. So they, we had the power, the context of these scriptures is the power of a holy church. Here it appears that people were not being added to the apostles, but were being added to the church. So as we get together with churches, and let's use this church as an example, we are not trying to grow New Life Church. Now, we're totally open unto the Lord adding to New Life Church as He see fit. We're totally open to that. Now, it can be, and that's, that's a loaded question or statement. The reason is the Lord will add to this church probably as He's pleased with this church. 
The Lord's got to decide if He wants to take a chance on sending somebody here. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that's the only reason a church would grow. It couldn't, some, there are some churches that are the size that they are in because they're strategically placed to pull off a strategic task. Some of the most powerful churches today are home, home churches. Most powerful, 10, 12, 15, 20 people. Some of the most powerful churches today are home churches, and they're pulling off what the Holy Spirit would have them to pull off in a strategic place. So the number of people is not the issue, even though we as people gauge success by the numbers of people. Now, if you're in leadership, more people just means more problems. Somebody say amen. That's all it means. More people, more problems. So you can say then, is that really growth? All right. So that's not how you measure church. You measure, the idea of church is if you can come to this church, we can take the Word of God and you can learn something. You can grow. Amen. Our job is to grow the believer that's here, to help mature a believer that's here. Now, personal, personally, uh, Abel is here with us from Cuba. He has work there that we give in to, and Trevor and Michael are the lead uh, persons out of this congregation. They take people down there to help Abel with his church in Cuba. And uh, we purposefully believe, prophetically, that that church will be major in the revival in Cuba. Now, I don't say that just to say that. I really don't. I say that because I believe that. And Abel doesn't, he, he, works, he works it real good and not taking credit. He gives it to the Lord. I've watched him all the way through. And I'll tell you, if he messes up, he's going to have to do it from here on. Because up to here, he's done good. Staying humble, giving credit to the Lord. And the Lord's adding to his church about as fast as they can get the doors open. But it, it's, it's proper. We're part of that. He considers himself a new life in Cuba. He's an extinct. You need to keep up with him, pray for him. Because that's, that's what he considers himself. Uh, they, Trevor and Michael and a group, just got back there from last week. They, spiritually, it was incredible off the charts. Physically, they're, 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 they're pretty weak. Physically, they got they they got kind of kind of beat up, but that I don't I don't even care about that. Spiritually, they did well. The other part of the time, a little bit of time gets it. So we see that they were added. The churches were added to as the Lord saw fit. Same way in Cuba. Same way here. We want the Lord to add to this church. Okay, now. No doubt they were scared of them, and rightfully so. so. I say scared of them are the apostles. you got to understand a few uh, verses back you had the story of Ananias and Sapphira. So no wonder they probably said, we ain't going to, we're kind of scared of you guys. We're, you see what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that they respectfully did it. I kind of believe they were halfway scared of that crowd, especially if, if two people got carried out on a stretcher with a sheet pulled over their head. Now, here we go, say it in this context again. Verse 15, Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and, and couches. So kind of, healing was kind of a big deal there, right? Would you say? I mean, what was standing out here in their mess? They preaching the kingdom of God, preaching Jesus was the Messiah. Peter was preaching, you killed the king. But in that preaching, people were getting healed. You're like, how, well, do you mean they didn't have a healing service? No, no. Peter had a convicting service of condemning the nation Israel of killing Jesus. That was his message. And so the point being, Peter was being true to the message he was to preach, and the Holy Ghost was being true to being there. Listen, how can God be in the house and somebody not get healed? That, that's the question. We shouldn't be surprised. We come in here, somebody ought to get healed every time we gather just because God's among us. He didn't even pray for it just because of His presence. Now here's the issue as we move into the context of these next few verses. And that is this, what we call the presence of God. 
Now, in Christianity, in Christendom, when you sit there and say, I can tell, I can feel the presence of God in the room, you got to understand you're sitting beside somebody that is saying, you're a lunatic, you're crazy, and it's all in your mind. That's right. I'm just telling you the truth. How do I know that's true? I used to be like that. That's how come. So, so it's true. But it's also true that this is a truth that you can tell when the presence of God is in a room, in a corporate manner, in a different manner, and Him not being in the room. There's something happens when we magnify God. Y'all into magnifying God? If you're into magnifying God, what does that mean? You take a magnifying glass means you make something bigger than what it really is at the moment. So we could not even have the presence of God. But if we start magnifying God, that means we're putting a magnifying glass on God and we're saying, God, will you be bigger than you are right now in this room? And if you hold it there long enough... If you're outside and got a magnifying glass and you hold it there long enough on a bunch of leaves, what'll happen? It'll set it on fire. Now you got to understand something. I sent out a verse of scripture this morning to leaders everywhere in Leviticus. And the scripture says this God, you got to understand, God lit the fire on the altar, but the priest kept it burning. Can you hear me? You're all in here, priests and kings. It's up to everybody in here to keep the fire burning. We're wanting God to come in and ignite the fire every Sunday. No, not so. God's lit the fire of the Spirit. It's in Leviticus. The priests are to keep it burning. We have a responsibility when you come in here to church to keep the fire of God burning in this place. Now, come on. Repent and say so. Come on. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. Telling you the truth. And we come in here and say, well, is the fire of God going to show up today? Touch me if you can, God. Right? Is the fire going to show up? Not understanding we have a responsibility that the fire's burning. Now, that, now that's what happens. So here we see that it says, they brought the sick in, beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Wow. <laughs> Somebody say, wow. Now, this scripture is not preached on much. And the reason is we don't have a lot of testimony of saying, hey, I walked into Walmart yesterday and my shadow fell on people and they got healed. We don't have a lot of those testimonies. I will admit, I have not heard many that say that, but it's in the book. So let's look into it here just a little deeper and see what the Scriptures is trying to tell us that in the early church, Peter's shadow fell on. Now as we go into it, I want you to keep one thing in mind. A shadow is not light. It's the opposite. It's the absence of light. Are you with me? That produces a shadow. How light do you have to be when your darkness contains the presence of God? <laughs> are, you, are you with me? What's the context? The power of a holy church. Peter and that crowd were so saturated with the presence of God that their very darkness still contained the presence of God. All right, let's, let's test it here. Let's see if that's true. talks about the shadow of Peter. One of the most prevalent uses of the shadow in the Bible signifies divine protection and refuge. The shadow depiction as a means of protection is inaugurated in the Old Testament and carried through to the New Testament. So we're seeing, why don't you understand, the shadow is a symbol, if you will, or represents, if you will, the protection, refuge, the presence of God. That's, that's the symbolic 
uh, uh, understanding of, of shadow. An example can be seen in Psalm 17, verse 8 where King David prays, Keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me under the shadow of your wings. Hide me under the shadow. What that means is if you're hidden under the shadow of his wings, nobody sees you. Come on. That's the reason we don't want to stand up here and brag on you. If you raise three people from the dead, we're not going to brag on you. Is that okay? Because if you really, if it really happens, at best you're still under the shadow of his wing, and we can't see him, but we see the wing. That's right. So it's a mindset that we must all understand that we buy into, which is the scriptural mindset of how we walk in the presence of God. Amen. Here we go. Let's see what else we got here. Here the shadow of your wings refers to the protective care of God like a bird sheltering its young under its wings. Now, let's go to the next one, Acts 5.15. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on their beds and couches that at the shadow of, or the, there might be passed over them. Psalms 19.1. Who, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow. Are you with me? So you got to understand, when you're in a shadow, you're in a dark spot. You're, you're, you're in a dark spot. You're not at a place that you will, you're not at a place that you think you're the smartest and most spiritual you've ever been. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's the opposite of that. Right. And so here we see that, that this entails the idea. Uh, absolute security and protection under the sovereign power of the Almighty. And there is also our challenge. When we get into worry, anxiety, and fear, we're coming out from under the shadow of His wing. Are you with me? It's under the shadow of His wing that we're not seen. It's okay, you got it. I, don't, I can tell Holy Ghost says you got it. Here we go. Here it is in Isaiah 49. The Lord's servant says... He made me like a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He made me a sharpened sword and hid me in the shadow of his arm. There again, what he's saying is if you're in the shadows, when Peter had a shadow, it wasn't his shadow, it was his spiritual position in Christ, in God, in his spiritual relationship. Here again, the shadow symbolically conveys divine protection. Are you with me? Now, let's go a little further. It does not say that the shadow of Peter actually healed them. The word shadow is an illusion of the presence of God. Are you with me? He says the shadow, it, 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 that is a symbol, it is an illusion of the presence of God. And when we look into the illusion and to the Scripture, it says it's a, we're covered by Him. We're under His wing. We have protection. So what it means is, you are under God. You are in His presence. So therefore, the presence, the shadow, and I pray that that shadow of God is in this place this morning. Amen. Understanding. Shadow is a place of darkness, but it is there that God covers us. Amen. We can have a bad diagnosis. We can have all, all kinds of things. Run to the shadow of his wing. Okay, let's look. Now, let's move quickly here. <clears throat> here it says, the symbol of shadow also implies it is passing by. Now, there's one thing about the shadow, it comes and goes, right? It's not a permanent state. It comes and it goes, and the shadow is... So the presence of God, the illusion, the symbolic representation, here is the presence of God, it comes and it tends to go. Why? He's alive. He's real. A shadow is not permanent. It's a temporary state. In Job 8 through 9, it says, Bildad, one of Job's friends, speaks of their earthly life. 
For we were born only yesterday and know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. Can you see that? You speak about our days on earth are just, we're just passing through. I talked to a guy the other day, and he thought he was, he was having some hard times. I'll have to admit, if he was having hard times, he kind of had half of his life all in one day. Are you with me? And he looked at, he, he called me and talked to me and said, Alan, I hate to say this, but Job thought he had it hard. <laughs> so anyways, if you knew his story, you'd, he could almost say that. So, but we see that a shadow here, and in Job, that not only are the illusion and the symbol of shadow, what do we learn about the presence of God? We learn that it, it is something that is passing, and that's the same reference and words of shadow there. This statement refers to the nature of human life, emphasizing its fleeting existence. In the New Testament, Apostle Paul brings up the symbolism of a shadow in Colossians. Let's look what Paul says here. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or in a new moon or in Sabbath day, which are what? Shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. So you can see that all these symbols, and he gave some references here, are shadows. We don't worship the symbol. He's speaking to us in a language, and that lays a prophetic language. God, you, you got to understand something. Don't let it throw you. When, when you read the word tree, T-R-E-E, -E, those letters are symbols. Uh, uh, they're just different symbols. God speaks in symbols. You say, well, why didn't he use, use English? Well, English is symbols. When you read the word tree, you have a mental imagery of a tree. All right, so so it's all it's all symbolic. Every, all kinds of language and communications and symbols. When it comes to the Bible, sometimes it throws people, and the reason it throws them, it's because when you read the symbols in the Scripture, it's like learning another language: Japanese, Spanish, whatever, Russian. I could give you uh, some words in all of those languages, but I won't right now because you know I've yet to receive the gift of tongues. But we'll not go into that this morning. So, so here, so he says it's shadow of things to come here. <clears throat> now you, can you understand why I chose this? All heroes are shadows of Christ. That's the reason John Piper said that. So when we're living life, we're wanting to live life as a shadow of Christ. We're not seen, but he is seen. And it just so happens, if we're willing to understand what it means to walk in the shadows of Christ, I believe that we could see more of Christ in our personal lives and in our meetings. If someone getting healed, somebody getting saved, just whatever. Come, you, you, why do I say that's possible? Because the reason a church is here is because we're in the restoration business. That's our business, is to restore things. Matter of fact, I'm trying to restore 4240 John Deere right now. It's 50, 45 years old. But the church is in the restoration business of that that's old, that that's broken, to restore. Now, when you re truly restore something, it is in better shape than this original form. Can you hear that? There's something about restoring. Why do people want things that were made 40, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Everybody's looking for a vehicle that does not have a computer in it. Everybody. Can I just find me a 48 Volkswagen? Right? Something that just does. So, <coughs> restoration is a good thing. When you were informed in the mind of God before the foundations of the earth, you were in perfect form. You came to this earth into a fallen nature. The reason we're here on this earth is because God's calling us back to that time that He thought of us before the foundations of the earth in His heart. 
Everybody that's a believer was in the heart before the, his heart before the foundations of the earth. And the reason he's calling us into obedience now is so we're walking towards that person that's in the heart of God before he even created the earth. You were in God's heart before he even created all this stuff. And the reason we're on this earth is he's calling us unto whom that is. Uh, it appears to me that humanity, everybody's looking for somebody. Everybody's looking for this person who is trustworthy and honest and will not betray them. Everybody's looking for this perfect spouse or this perfect person. Everybody down deep are looking for this person. Not understanding the person you're looking for is whom you are to become in the heart of God before the foundations of the earth. Amen. Have you noticed how nobody does it like you would do it? Duh. Right? You were trying to walk unto whom you were to be in the, that you were and are in the heart of God before the foundations of the earth. We're to walk in. We're looking for that person. One day you will be that person. If that statement's true, how many believes that? One day you'll be that person. You'll be perfected. Well, pray tell, how can that be true and you not yearn for it now. You're yearning for it now. Now quit blaming everybody else for not living up to whom you're going to be. I set that one up for you, didn't I? Every one of you stepped right in the middle of it. Because it's the truth. Quit blaming everybody else for not living up to whom you're to be. And that's mostly what happens in the church. If you're going to live up unto whom you're to be, go be it. Yes, go be it. And, and let the rest of us off the hook. Somebody say, man, please. So now you see and understand why he says all heroes are shadows of Christ. I just got this feeling as if we understand that and start walking more into it and embrace the Word of God. That as we walk in here, you, the idea is I won't see you, you won't see me, but I'll see Christ in you. And you'll see Christ in me. And we're all hidden under the shadow of His wings. How in the world could a lost person come in and make it ten minutes? How in the world? How in the world could sickness come in these doors and not be healed? I just wonder. I, I'm not making a statement, but I do wonder. Now, let's move on. The powers of the Holy Church as we're moving forward here. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about him, and round about uh, unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and they were, were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. So the point being, the church house, I believe, is to be a place where all the sick and afflicted and the demon-possessed come every Sunday. And there's enough of the covering of the true presence and the shadow of God here that you can't come in the doors but what you're not healed or set free. Amen. Just there you go. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I agree it's not our experience. But I'm persuaded it could be. And I will, until I die, be striving for that day. Now let's watch this. The church was obedient here. The church was spirit-filled. The church was powerful. Now I'm going to go into the next phase here of a group of, scri of Scripture. We're changing context just a little bit. Same time period, same everything. But I, there again, I'm trying to group the Scripture to show you how we keep things within context when we make that. Now we're going to Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 28. Now the title I put on this one is the, is the second persecution. First persecution was four. Now it's the second persecution. We'll be going into the third. But the emphasis of these 17 through 28 is persecution. Why are they persecuted? Because of the previous verses we just went over. That's why. Had to, I mean, come on. If you walked in the shadow of Peter and you get healed, that's going to stir up some conflict. 
And you'd think everybody would like that. Have you ever told somebody about a miracle that God did in your life, and you're telling them, just waiting for them to jump up and down, and after you get done, they look at you like they're looking at you like, are you absolutely out of your mind? <laughs> they don't appreciate it like you appreciate it. They don't receive the miracle that you received. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? That happened with Peter and the guys, and it brought persecution upon them. Here we have it in verses 17 through 28, the second persecution. Then the high priest rose up, and all uh, they that were with him, which is a set of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. You see that? The high priest rose up, and all that. Listen, if you stir up enough commotion to stir up the high priest, you've done a pretty good stirring. Okay, this is pretty. Pretty good stir, and the high priest got upset here. <clears throat> it says they were all filled with indignation. When Jesus walked the earth, the Pharisees were in power of the Sanhedrin. You got the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and you got the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin can be made up of both of those groups. It's the governing assembly, is the Sanhedrin, if you will. In the book of Acts, the Sadducees, or what's considered the liberals, were now in control of the Sanhedrin. Now, I said this a few weeks back. I'm going to say it again for those of you that maybe didn't hear it. you got the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Your Sadducees tends to be the liberals. Pharisees tends to be the conservatives. All right, the idea here is converting Jews unto the message that, that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, we got record of some Pharisees being converted, but we don't have a record I've found yet of any of the liberals. It's, you can put that where you want to. And uh, I didn't say there wasn't any liberals saved. I, I am beginning to wonder, but that doesn't have anything to do with it. Now, the Sanhedrin was a Jewish court of law. and legislative assembly that existed in ancient Israel from around the second century BC and until 425 uh, should be AD CE there the term or CE it is before the term Sanhedrin comes from a Greek word uh, meaning council or assembly that's who the so here the here's his high priest and he calls to the big group the Sanhedrin hey we Peter must have really been making a stink to to call together this big assembly the Pharisees who led in the persecution against Jesus, but it was the Sadducees who led in the persecution against the early church. They, the healings were an embarrassment because they denied the supernatural. They, we have a group today that just totally don't believe that the supernatural is uh, real. So you can say, well, why did a lot of people not like miracles in our churches? It's because it's an embarrassment. See, they don't believe it's so. It can't happen. So if it can't happen, and it happens in your church service or at your home or with your prayer, it's an embarrassment if you don't believe in it. I mean, I, I get that. But I'd rather be an embarrassed healed man <laughs> as an unhealed, not embarrassed man. I, have you noticed any time you make a movement closer to God that He embarrasses you? It's in, am I the only one? Come on. Am I the only one? I have yet to make a move closer in God with my pride fully intact. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's not happened. There's something about it that my pride has to be embarrassed before I can make a true movement. Now you can say, well, Alan, I know of times that's not true. I, and I agree there are some times we could just take truth and go with it. But you'll have to agree with me, there's some truth that only comes through because God so embarrasses us. Listen, if you get really good embarrassed, don't repent. You don't want the next one on his list. Right. All right? You just don't. Go with the embarrassment. Embarrassment is correction 101. That's all. And just, just do it and go with it. All of us sitting in here, whether you believe it or not, are under this idea that we're all being saved, we all do embarrassing things, we all have a little bit of pride in our theology and how we think. We all understand this, and we're willing to allow for all of our stupidity. Did I use the word stupidity? And it's the truth, y'all. We are a group of people that comes together. 
realizing you, I'm in a lot, quite a few churches, and this church is more diverse in its theological standing, in its hermeneutical understanding of end times, this group of people is probably more different than any, as small as we are, as any group of people that I encounter. But this group of people also has another problem. As a group, you want the presence of God to show up more than you could eat. You're willing to lay down your theology. You're willing to lay down your hardness. You're willing to allow some people to do theology wrong if God will show up in the house and save my child or heal my friend. We're all willing. We're a little different. I'm not saying it doesn't take everything we got sometime. But we're, we're willing to back up and say, God, please be God. Please show up on the scene. So what do we have in common here? It's the love and it's the desire and it's for the presence of God to invade our stupidity, for the invasion of the presence of God to invade what we do right, what we do wrong. We can't carry a note in a bucket, and the presence of God shows up. Amen. That is what this congregation has in common. Can you allow for that? Amen. And if we ever lose the ability to respect each other where they are, we have lost the possibility of one day God invading this place and slapping the slobber out of all of us. Now, I'm waiting for that day, and I'll tell you on something. I think it's building. Be very honest with you. I don't know if it's because of us or because things are getting so hard out here. But I'll take it either way. Now, let's look at it with what happened to them about these healings of embarrassment. Here at this second persecution. Now we're going to pick up here in verse 18. And laid their, their hands on the apostles and put them in common prison. That wasn't the laying on the hands for a healing, I might add. They laid their hands and put them in common prison. Now the, what's a common prison? A common prison is a debtor's prison. If you didn't pay your debt, you went into what was called common prison and you had to spend so much time. And when you spent your time there, it just so happens they would write you a a document, a full payment of whatever you owed, you know, because you paid it off and time served. And that is where we also even get our prison system today. And it says, so opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple. No, I'm sorry, verse 19. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Wow. In prison, angel shows up, says, okay, go, come with me. You're going to go preaching here. Go stand and speak in the temple of the people, all the words of the life. Didn't say go down in the street behind a secret place. Said go to the temple. Like they weren't going to be noticed. Like you can do that incognito. So here we go. The words of life, verse 21. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they were with him and called the council together. Can you see that? I want you to get the emphasis here. It says in verse 21, And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came. There he is again. That's the big guy. The high priest came, and they that were with him and called the council together. That's a big deal. It's like Trevor walking into Washington, and they called together the Senate and the House. Joint committee meeting over this guy. That's what was happening here. And they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they were with him, and called the council together. And all the Senate of the children of Israel, see it? And sent to the prison to have them brought. They say, "Well, you go to see." They didn't even know they were there yet. But he said, "Listen, let's come. Go bring them here to us." But when the officers came and found them not in prison, they returned and told, saying, "The prison truly found. We shut up with all the safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within." The problem is, the 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 guys over the prison, if they escaped, were going to have to serve that man's 
uh, a prison term. A, a little concerning there, right? <clears throat> now I want you to take the symbolic, see what's happened symbolically here. We all were set free from prison. And Jesus took our place. Come on. Jesus took our place and set us free. Can you see that? Now we're going to go on, keep, hang with the sim symbolism here. This was a debtor's prison. Someone must pay the debt in full for you to be released. This was an illusion of what Jesus was doing. Are you with me? Now, I am going to have to stop there. It is actually 1031. I went one minute over. Uh, we will start uh, in verse, uh, ever what the next verse is there, 24 uh, next week. We'll pick up there with this same understanding. I hope that you can hang on to what we've said about the shadow. All of this stuff builds on itself. The humility we must maintain. Being in the shadow of Christ. We don't outshine Christ. We're in the shadow of Christ. That He might be magnified in the moment. Now all of that's, listen, I'm all for the grace of God, but you don't apply the grace of God there. I mean, when we mess up, we do. But to some of this, we need to do kind of get halfway right. Is that we allow the presence and the shadow of God to show up in this place. I can't wait to show you what I got next week. Come back if you would, if you'd like to hear some more. I'll be nicer next week. <laughs> Let's stand. <laughs> Lord, Lord Jesus, we love you. And I thank you for this group of people that's here. Thank you for those that are watching online. And Lord, you know our deal. If there's anything that I've said is not of you, I pray it'll fall to the ground. If there's anything I have said of you, I pray it'll be quickened to our hearts. That we might understand, Lord Jesus, let us understand what it means to be a child of God on this side of eternity. Dear God, let us blow it out on this side. Don't let us get to the other side and say, I wish I would have. Dear God, I pray that New Life Church will not have a reason to give an excuse on what we wish we would have. But we pray and we say, oh God, show us. We'll apply the obedience unto your word, your will, and your way. And this church house of God said, amen and amen.